For the past three years, COVID-19 has challenged the health and livelihoods of billions around the world. Now, with vaccines distributed in most countries and a majority of people with some degree of immunity, it feels as though we're moving into a post-COVID era. But doctors warn, underestimating a virus that continues to mutate can be costly. We are going to discuss the projected path of the pandemic heading into spring, just as those who received the bivalent booster shot six months ago are wondering when it's time for another. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later on tonight, our special guest will be Dr. Mark Rupp, who serves as the Chief of Infectious Diseases. He's also the Medical Director of Infection Control and Epidemiology at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So we look forward to bringing him on board tonight. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for joining us as always. I know our viewers are looking forward to asking you their questions directly, but first, let's start with the latest data around the globe tonight. What are you tracking? Sure. Well, thank you uh, again, and I very much look forward to engaging our viewers as we do every week at this time. Hard to believe how many years we've been doing this together. And yes, we are still talking about COVID and so many other health matters that directly affect uh, rural America. So let's get right into the graphics, Christina, because I do think the changes we're seeing are favorable worldwide and also locally across the country. If you look at the at the global map, you can see that it continues to look more favorable every week. And as a matter of fact, uh, other than for some uh, activity in New Zealand and some in Eastern Europe and a bit uh, on the western coast of South America, uh, we continue to improve week over week and month over month in the number of cases, uh, test positivity rates, infections, uh, as well as uh, hospitalizations. If you look at the global data per se, uh, you can see we're in a pretty flat stage now. We're at about two cases per 100,000. Again, significantly undercounting, but that's about 150,000 cases per day, uh, uh, you know, over the last uh, 24 hours. You know, if we uh, look at some of the U.S. numbers, uh, a rather different story. Uh, if we see a bit of activity in the central part of the U.S., uh, some in Oklahoma, northern Texas, uh, a bit in Nebraska here, South Dakota, etc., cetera, uh, some in the Four Corners region. Again, uh, some increased activity actually in Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, uh, and in West Virginia. But overall, the, the U.S. numbers do continue to fall. Overall case counts running 14-day average, 9 per 100,000. That's down one since last week. Uh, just under 30,000 cases reported uh, yesterday. Test positivity is down. Uh, hospitalization rates are down uh, still. Over uh, 23,000, almost 24,000 Americans are hospitalized right now. And the number of deaths do vary a bit because of case reporting, but overall, uh, they're continuing to slowly uh, but surely fall off. And when we look at now some of the numbers uh, by states and municipalities, you can see uh, 29,000 cases uh, in the last uh, 24 hours. But Florida uh, is about 19 per 100,000, about twice the U.S. average. Kentucky, Delaware, Maine, and Oklahoma, one and a half to two times roughly uh, the U.S. average. Well, that's when you look at it by state. But when we look at it by smaller counties, whether it's in Texas, North Dakota, Kentucky, uh, Arkansas, parts of Virginia, you can see that those numbers are significantly larger, you know, per 100,000 population. And again, just making the point that uh, COVID and for that matter, all infectious diseases when they get into a small community, a ranching or farming community, they can be extremely problematic if they emanate from a church service or a community gathering or a family wedding or, or something uh, of that nature, which seems to be the name of the game uh, as it relates to the spread of not just COVID, but RSV and <clears throat> influenza 
and so many other of these respiratory uh, viruses. You know, if we look at wastewater levels, again, the news here is better and better each week. <clears throat> They're just under 1,500 sampling sites that we've recorded here. And as you can see, the only sectors of the map that are increasing are the lowest possible sectors, the blue and the gray, 0 to 19 percent, which is up 18 percent total, and the 20 to 39 percent of uh, maximum uh, virus level. Indeed, the highest levels, the red and the amber, <clears throat> are down between 23 and 29 percent. The, clearly, there are some parts of the country, uh, particularly mirroring the map we looked at a few minutes ago, that do have bright red and amber coloration. You know, look at some of the areas around the Great Lakes, parts of Maine and New Hampshire, you know, just a bit uh, uh, here in uh, eastern Nebraska and western Iowa, some in Missouri. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we're looking at fairly favorable wastewater levels, which has turned out to be a very good predictor, independent of case numbers, independent of test positivity, because this doesn't depend on the accuracy of reporting of individuals, willingness to be tested, et cetera. This just depends on the number of virus particles that are picked up in the wastewater uh, in these uh, communities. Uh, this is the usual map that we look at uh, for what's called the NOWCAST model, which looks at the variants across the U.S. And again, as has been the trend for the last several weeks, the XBB 1.5, the variant that we've been tracking now for the last month or two months, uh, is just under 90 percent of all the infection uh, seen in the, in the United States. And it does not appear, at least here or in Europe, in other parts of the Indian continent and Africa, or elsewhere that we track it, that there are other more competitive variants. And uh, it could be uh, that the XBB is the most competitive, most transmissible, highest reproduction factor variant that we've seen yet and has been most successful in evading our vaccines and our immunity uh, and that's why it's about 90 percent of all the infections. And there is still a bit of variability across the country and the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast uh, seem to be almost 100 uh, uh, percent XBB uh, 1.5, uh, somewhat less in the central part of the United States. But unless something changes, uh, we'll become very close to 100 percent XBB. Uh, up to and until, as you mentioned in the introduction, Christina, another more competitive variant uh, shows up on the scene, and then we're off to the races, uh, resetting the clock uh, all over again. If we look at hospitalizations and ICU care, again, the trend is favorable. Looks like it continues to fall, albeit slowly. Uh, the number of both individuals in hospitals uh, and in the ICU are well down. <clears throat> we look at that geographically, we're at about seven per 100,000 or just under 24,000 Americans hospitalized currently. Uh, about twice that to one and a half times that in Delaware, Maine, North Carolina. Indeed, our nation's capital amazingly stays on this list uh, with about twice uh, the U.S. average. <clears throat> and Missouri uh, is now on this list at about one and a half times uh, the U.S. average of hospitalizations identified as being due to COVID. You know, when we look at the number of deaths, <clears throat> last week we pointed out the, uh, the blip in the total number of deaths and uh, thought that that might be somewhat artifactual due to delayed reporting. And it is somewhat down now, although it still has not come down to baseline. And as we uh, said, uh, there are still far too many deaths in the country. Uh, to consider this behind us, just under 400 deaths just yesterday. That's 400 members of our families, our friends, people that we work with, go to church with, you know, celebrate our holidays with, who just won't be with us uh, next week and next month and on their birthdays and ours. But the death rate is down to uh, 0.12 per 100,000 uh, over the last 14 days. But West Virginia, two and a half times that, Oklahoma, New York, South Carolina and even Florida, one and a half to twice the average uh, U.S. death rate. So we continue to follow that very closely. Uh, this graphic I tend to really like because it looks at all of the viral, uh, uh, you know, spread respiratory illness 
deaths that we track in the United States. So this includes influenza, it includes COVID and so many others. It comes from the National Center for Health Statistics Mortality Surveillance System. And this is updated uh, as approximately a week ago from March 9th. And what you can see is after a fairly good decline and an approach towards baseline, uh, we're still in a plateau stage and we're still above that double wavy line, which would be the usual flu deaths uh, reported uh, in the United States. And so we're still uh, at a stage above that. And this is largely still COVID. Uh, not too much of it is RSV or rotavirus or other of the typical respiratory uh, influenza-like diseases uh, that we see. If we look at the vaccine status of the United States, uh, this graphic has not changed in the better part of a year. About 34% are boosted, 68% fully vaxxed. Uh, and again, uh, hopefully we'll get an opportunity when we speak with Dr. Rupp uh, to understand what are the current recommendations, where do we think the FDA and the CDC are going, and hopefully uh, can unpack that a bit uh, later in the broadcast today, because we get asked these questions all the time. If you look at the total number of vaccines being administered in the U.S., again, fairly flat. Almost all of these are the bivalent boosters. Very, very few individuals who have not had a primary series, series previously are now getting boosted or vaxxed. And indeed, the slight uptick that we're seeing uh, relates to some of the outbreaks that are occurring across the country in long-term care facilities uh, in the U.S., where we're seeing more and more COVID both in staff and in the elderly occupants of some of those long-term care uh, facilities. You know, I wanted to remind our audience uh, today because we're gonna be talking about post-acute COVID or long COVID uh, during the remainder of the show, uh, that the risk factors are, are quite significant. So if you look at, at the very top of the list, hospitalization, Individuals, this is uh, a group of veterans that were, dis that were studied, a very, very large group of veterans. Uh, so again, <clears throat> mostly male, uh, mostly somewhat older. Uh, what you can see here is that they had nearly an eight-fold higher rate of hospitalization three months out from their original COVID infection than individuals that did not have COVID. And long-term hospitalization due to long COVID, due to post-acute COVID. The onset of kidney disease, heart disease, uh, blood clotting, uh, lung disease, between four and five times higher chance, 500% higher chance than those that did not have COVID. And then some of the more common uh, fatigue, onset of new diabetes, uh, mental health considerations, muscle weakness, uh, loss of sleep, loss of taste and smell, extremely common, uh, but less so, interestingly, than hospitalization, uh, kidney disease, heart disease, and blood uh, clotting abnormalities. And this was another study uh, that I look at a lot, which looks at the percentage of the population that has these long haul COVID uh, symptoms. And you know, fatigue uh, was as much as 16%. You know, almost one in seven of those uh, that were uh, diagnosed with COVID early on after the first 30 days uh, complained of this particular fatigue-like syndrome. If you go out to six to seven months, uh, you're down to about half that, about 8%. Uh, but that's still about one in 12 people that have had COVID will have fatigue. You know, less so for loss of sleep and respiratory problems, less so for hair loss and other things. But just making the point that uh, COVID produces a fairly high risk of some of these long post-acute symptoms uh, and some of them deal and stay for a long time. We've seen other studies uh, of the duration of these symptoms on, at over two years now that continue to occur uh, at a significant severity that costs lack of school uh, for some of our kiddos, that costs people to not be able to fully return to work or to do other things to be productive members of their society, loss of uh, a physical endurance, uh, loss of appetite, uh, and so many other things. 
And so as we move into this stage of COVID where the actual hospitalization numbers and deaths and total case counts continue to look more and more favorable, and hopefully they will, a better understanding of some of these long haul symptoms and how to prevent them and block them and how to treat them when they occur is going to become increasingly important. So I think that's the last graphic that we wanted to share with the audience today. And I look forward to answering our questions and, of course, in a few minutes, uh, introducing Dr. Mark Rupp to our audience. Absolutely. We are going to have a riveting conversation tonight, and you at home are very much so a part of it. You're a huge part of this show altogether. I want to give you the number now to give us a call. 877-731-6733 is the number to join our conversation. How is the pandemic impacting your life at this point, three years later after it began? We'd like to hear from you tonight or any questions that you might have as well. We will be bringing Dr. Rupp back into the conversation in just a moment, but we've got to hit the headlines first, Dr. Gold. We have been talking a lot about this origin story. Now, this past Friday, the House unanimously voted to declassify U.S. intelligence information about the origins of COVID. We know that this is significant from a national security perspective, but talk about why it's also important to know where it came from, scientifically speaking. Sure. And Christina, this is a very important question that it would be best if we can answer. And, you know, as we've discussed previously, I'm not sure we'll ever get a fully accurate answer to it. But if this does turn out to be due to a laboratory uh, research study, it would be very important to know what went wrong. And that's because we have to continue to do research on these highly transmissible viruses, or we will never have vaccines, treatments, diagnostic tests that we can use when we need them. And you know, COVID is tragic. Uh, there have been millions and millions of lives that have been lost. The economies have been ravaged. People's education has been turned upside down. Uh, all kinds of food insecurity and home insecurity has occurred. But the case fatality rates are still hovering approximately 1%. There are viruses out there, like, you know, we've done a lot of discussions about uh, Ebola virus. Uh, we've talked about Marburg and, and so many others that have case fatality rates in excess of one out of two or in excess of 50%. So we really need to be able to do highly uh, secured research uh, on all of these viruses so that we can diagnose them and we can prevent them and treat them, create vaccines uh, when and if we need them. You know, even the H5N1 uh, avian flu virus that we've talked about so much because of what it has done to the poultry industry and, of course, the price of a dozen eggs, uh, that's a much more lethal disease, frankly, uh, than COVID or common, uh, you know, human seasonal influenza is. And again, uh, so we have to be able to do this research. And so understanding if this was a challenge that was created as a result of a leakage from a laboratory, and no one's in invoking intentionality or lack of intentionality, but if there's something that we could be doing better to protect uh, the globe, and in case of the U.S., to better protect our citizens, it would be really nice to know that. Now, having said that, spread from the wild is something we've seen an awful lot of, these so-called zoonotic infections where viruses jump from bats to mammals and mammals to humans and humans back to uh, other mammals again. Also a very serious consideration. Uh, probably less than we can do about that other than to continue to do research on these viruses. So we have a, you know, a stocked library of the genetic sequences. We have a stocked library of potential vaccines and treatments. So we know if disease X, as it's referred to, occurs next year, we have a pretty good idea of how we're going to diagnose it, how we're going to create vaccines and prevent it, and then when necessary, how we're going to treat it. But if we don't do that research, we're going to be pretty flat-footed uh, going into the future. Absolutely. It seems as though um, at this point it, we are being very reactive as well, and having this origin information would help us to be more proactive going forward. So we mm -hmm. will have to find out what's going to happen with that. We appreciate your transparency so much, Dr. Gold. This is a question that I'm wondering about. 
Now that we are three years deep into this pandemic, is there evidence of people actually being fully immune to COVID or are we all still kind of dealing with that partial immunity? I think we are all dealing with partial immunity, Christina. Uh, I think it's very variable depending upon age and comorbidity. You know, those that are over 65, 75 and 85 are at higher risk of reinfection. Uh, and those that live in, you know, uh, senior living facilities, uh, long-term care facilities are at higher risk. Those that are being treated for cancer or have weakness of their immune system are at higher risk. But even the lowest risk populations, the young, healthy, you know, really intense immune systems, uh, individuals, uh, you know, think our college students, our K-12 students, et cetera, who've had a lot of virus exposure, you know, this virus has really ripped through our preschool systems, our K-12 systems uh, as well, are still getting uh, reinfected. In indeed, uh, uh, I know just a lot of kids uh, that are in the early grades uh, who had COVID, you know, one or two years ago and had it again in the last six months. So the severity of the illness is each sequence appears to be less. The duration of symptoms appears to be less with subsequent reinfections. But I don't think that anybody can, you know, raise their hand and say, uh, I'm invincible or I'm immune, even those who have been infected and are fully vaccinated and boosted. And that's why the question of what's the future for vaccines becomes so relevant, particularly for those at risk. Yeah, especially right now when so many are wondering, hey, six months ago, I was told to get a bivalent booster shot. I did so. It's been six months. What do I do now? Hold that thought. We are going to get the answer to that right after this quick break. Plus, we're going to open up our phone lines and we want to hear from you. 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. Maybe you're wondering if it's time to get another booster shot. We will address that with Dr. Gold. Plus, Dr. Mark Rupp will join our conversation on the other side of this break. Find out if there's any other infectious diseases that we need to be keeping an eye on. That's next right here only on Rural Health Matters. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. I want to make sure you have the number 877-731-6733 because you are a big part of this show. We are going to go to the phone lines in just a moment. I want to welcome back world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Mark Rupp. Now, Dr. Rupp, is an infectious diseases expert who's been on the front lines in the fight against Ebola, now COVID-19. He has dedicated his career to treating, studying, and preventing the spread of contagious diseases. And he actually treated some of the very first Americans to contract the virus. Throughout the pandemic, he has become one of the leading voices in explaining the disease to Americans. You've seen him on CNN, you've seen him on Fox News, and of course, right here, on Rural Health Matters. You are definitely a fan favorite on this show, Dr. Rupp, welcome back. Now, many of us have been done with the pandemic for some time now, but is the pandemic done with us? That's the big question. Well, Christina, um, I completely agree with you. When I'm uh, out on the streets, it looks like most people are completely disregarding uh, any sort of pandemic precautions, but indeed the virus is not done with us. And I think that uh, Dr. Gold did a great job in showing the current situation with the various graphics and discussion that he had. Uh, you know, we still have somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 people per day dying of COVID-19. You do the math and that's nearly 150,000 persons. And as Dr. Gold related, uh, these are our grandmothers and grandfathers, our uncles, our aunts, uh, you know, very cherished family members. And um, you're going to miss them. And this is, you know, a very poignant illustration that this pandemic continues to uh, go on, albeit that it has evolved. And I think many, many people uh, are adjusting to having the pandemic and getting on with their lives. But they can do a few things to make it safer for themselves and they can stay up to date with their vaccine. And that makes it uh, so much safer for them if they're able to do that. Okay, and we have a lot of people out there. We've been getting a lot of calls for the past few weeks wondering, when do I get another booster shot? Am I supposed to talk to my doctor about this? Do I wait on a national announcement? 
Dr. Rupp, what's the best protocol here? Well, again, I would encourage patients to certainly talk with their own personal physicians and their providers to decide uh, what's best for them. Uh, the, the bivalent booster is what would be available to people now, and it continues to be under an EUA in which there is no recommendation for a second dose at this point. As Dr. Gold pointed out, we know that immunity wanes relatively quickly with these uh, vaccines, and therefore in people who are at highest risk, it does make some sense that they would go on and get that uh, uh, booster again uh, at some point here in the future. Now, the uh, federal government, the FDA, the CDC has signaled that they're trying to make this into more of a routine uh, booster dose that we would get in around the time of our influenza vaccine. That makes a lot of sense from a logistical standpoint of trying to uh, standardize our approach to the, to the pandemic. But for those people who are at highest risk with waning immunity, uh, it may be in their better self-interest to get that uh, next booster dose prior to the fall that we're talking about. In addition, there was some uh, uh, effort to try to combine the flu and the COVID booster together. It doesn't look like that's going to happen, at least for this upcoming flu, uh, flu season. Okay, and Dr. Gold, I will ask you because you are our leader by example. What, what are you doing in this case? How, how up to date are you when it comes to your booster shot? And what are we supposed to do, those of us who are just kind of scratching our head wondering when we're supposed to go back in and get another? Sure, so uh, like uh, many of our audience, uh, uh, I got my bivalent booster uh, you know, last fall, uh, shortly after it came out. Actually, uh, I did it on video so that all of our colleagues could see that I signed up and, uh, and got boosted uh, uh, at, at the appropriate time. But I have not uh, gotten boosted again. I've been really waiting to see uh, what the CDC uh, and the FDA and the Advisory uh, Council, uh, the ACIP, uh, is, is going to recommend. Uh, I'm also uh, interested in, uh, I know there are several other vaccines under development that go beyond the BA4 and BA5 Omicron subtypes that are looking at some of the multi-site uh, variability uh, that has been seen uh, in the XBB uh, variant. So, uh, you know, I continue to use my mask and I continue to uh, exert as many of the non-pharmacologic interventions as possible, particularly when I'm on a plane, in an airport, uh, on a train, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, one could say that I'm a bit rolling the dice, uh, but fortunately I'm uh, otherwise uh, quite healthy. Uh, you know, try to lead a balanced lifestyle, still exercise almost every day and things of that nature. Uh, and you know, just as I've discussed, I have had COVID actually. I had COVID back in uh, February of 2020, which uh, I didn't even know I had it. I thought I had a bad cold or the flu until I later tested positive on uh, some antibody testing that we were doing here as part of a uh, research uh, protocol. Hmm. So it doesn't make it right or wrong, but uh, I'm uh, certainly, uh, when the future recommendations come out, I do plan to follow them. But right now, uh, as many individuals uh, that I know, uh, other than those that are high risk are sitting tight. Now, I know quite a few people, though, who are in long-term care facilities, uh, who are older, <clears throat> uh, have m multiple medical problems, uh, who have gotten another round of the bivalent booster. But again, as Dr. Rupp said, that's a conversation that every individual should have with their healthcare professionals uh, and make a decision. Because, you know, no two individuals based on medication and comorbidity are the same. And so having a single sweeping answer is, uh, is, is probably not right at this time. No, and, and you're hardly rolling the dice, Dr. Gold. Let's, let's be real here. You know what you're doing. You know how to stay safe. And you know things about this virus that many of us will never understand. So we know that you are our leader. and We can follow the example that you set for all of us. We appreciate you. Our phone lines are lighting up upstairs. Ed from Wisconsin joins us. Thanks for leading us off tonight, Ed. Go right ahead. Yes, um, I uh, been diagnosed oh roughly six eight months ago with a, 
uh, illness, polymyalgia, rheumacata. Two words. Yeah, rheumatica. And uh, yep. it has Go ahead. to do. It has to do with the immune system, and uh, it's described to me that uh, what happens is, for whatever reason, your immune system goes wacky. What a what a medical term that is. Wacky. We don't know why, but it does. And when it does, your immune system proceeds to attack your body. And that includes your joints, your uh, muscles, tendons, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of pain. I had an attack here about two weeks ago, which I guess is what you would call the wacky. And, oh, my God, uh, the pain. I it, it, I was down here crying. I'm an 84-year-old man, and believe me, I just didn't know what to do. The pain was so terrible. <clears throat> Age grants me uh, permission to take aspirin, so uh, I've been taking since then three aspirin morning and evening, and that has helped. Uh, but uh, I am told that this autoimmune disease is going, you're going to see more of it. And in 30 years, it may be a very dominating force within the health care industry. The immune system going wacky, as they say it. So, uh, but if you want Marshfield Clinic, uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin, as well as Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, have excellent uh, internet printouts on the whole thing. And if you ask for it, in fact, uh, Mayo Clinic, at the top of their printout, they have the name and they have how to pronounce the second word. Well, Ed, thank you so much for calling, and I'm so sorry to hear that you're challenged uh, with this uh, polyarthritis uh, rheumatic uh, syndrome. And you're right, it is an autoimmune uh, syndrome, and the frequency and severity of some of these autoimmune diseases, of which more common diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma and lupus and all of the inflammatory bowel diseases, fall into these very, very similar categories of where our immune systems turn against some of our organs, in your case, muscles and joints and parts of your skeletal system. Dr. Rupp, is there any connection, do you think, to the increasing trend of autoimmune diseases and viral exposures or anything that's in the infectious disease world? Because people have speculated about that for a long time, of the you know, cross-reactivity that we see. You know, in my uh, days of clinical practice, you know, rheumatic heart disease, as you may know, uh, is tightly connected uh, to exposure to certain bacteria, which produced a, a tremendous amount of rheumatic heart disease uh, when we used to see these untreated infections uh, in early childhood. The kiddos would get over the infections, and then in their 20s and 30s, they would show up with heart failure uh, due to the cross-reactivity of the bacterium. 
<clears throat> and some of the immune structures on the heart valves uh, in our hearts. Any thoughts on that, yeah. Mark? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gold, that's a great comment. Um, you know, I share your um, sympathy for Ed. Um, I would suggest he stay in close contact with his uh, provider. Um, generally, polymyalgia rheumatica is treated with steroids and can be uh, very effectively treated with steroids. The main worry that we have with polymyalgia rheumatica is that when it involves the, the uh, arteries, you can get giant cell arteritis, uh, temporal arteritis, and cause uh, some real serious side effects and, and uh, complications. So, Ed, uh, please contact your provider and uh, stay in contact with them. Uh, the idea of viruses and bacteria causing autoimmune disease is one that we are familiar with and have been for quite some time as you point out, Dr. Gold, particularly with, uh, for instance, rheumatic heart disease. And the issue of viruses and bacteria providing molecular mimicry, in other words, uh, mimicking our own tissues and then inducing an autoimmune response to that is something that is uh, very, very interesting. We still have a lot to learn about it. And one of the theories around uh, the long COVID syndrome is something similar to that, where this virus induces an autoimmune response and may be uh, at least partly responsible for some of these long lingering symptoms that you already talked about, Dr. Gold, in your preamble with people who have cognitive problems, uh, fatigue, aches and pains, uh, onward and onward, just lots of different symptoms. One of the leading theories around that is that indeed this virus is triggering an autoimmune response. That's just uh, some degree of speculation at this point, but an awful lot of work is being done to better understand that. I appreciate that call. Thank you so much, Ed from Wisconsin. You've got a great passion and spirit about you, sir. And I like the way you use that word wacky. We don't get to hear that very often on this program. So thank you for that. We're going to Wyoming this time to speak with John. Thanks for joining us tonight, John. Go right ahead. I'm completely convinced of the importance of vaccines as it has been discussed over and over in many of your uh, uh, weekly uh, presentations, but the acceptance of those has been relatively low and disappointingly low. So my questions are, has anyone studied why the U.S. has such a low acceptance of the vaccines and boosters relatively? And number two, in the future, what different plan would there be to introduce and to get people to accept a vaccine if it really became important, if we had another pandemic or something where vaccine was really needed and needed to be covered by most of the people in the U.S.? Well, John, you are asking some of the most important questions that have been raised as a result of this pandemic experience not just here in the U.S., but globally. And that is, what is the role of scientific information and what I would call medical literacy? You know, the stuff that we learn in grade school about health, uh, about things that we need to do to have a long and prosperous life and to protect our bodies and those of our loved ones. And how does the role of misinformation and disinformation influence uh, our behaviors. Uh, and I think there are very serious lessons that have been learned here. On, it has to do with the overall, to me, it's the overall level of scientific literacy, uh, that is to say what we are actually teaching in the K-12 schools and at multiple different levels. Who are the trusted sources of information? Who are the what we call the influencers? And by that I mean not just the leading physicians and people in elected office, uh, et cetera, uh, but what about the people in uh, professional and collegiate athletics? What about the people that are in the theater? What about our you know, members of the you know, popular music, et cetera? Our, uh, you know, how does their role, their actions, what they say, what they do, uh, influence people uh, that really care? And how do we try to build a stronger platform around scientific and medical literacy uh, in the future? You know, we're almost exactly three years from when the first cases were uh, introduced uh, in the United States. And I would say that the skepticism 
uh, has been absolutely stable uh, since almost the very beginning and just continues to produce extremely low boosting rates uh, and low vaccination rates in this country uh, compared to other parts of the world. And indeed, the excess mortality that we have seen, the preventable mortality, uh, is estimated to be roughly at the level of a million Americans who could have been saved or would have not lost their battle with COVID uh, had they been fully uh, vaccinated uh, and boosted. And I'm going to guess, uh, John, that uh, there are people in your community that you either go to, used to go to work with or school or church or whatever uh, that aren't there anymore uh, whose lives might have been saved. This is a really good question for Dr. Rupp, who's very much in the forefront of delivering clinical care and advising people, not just here uh, in Nebraska, uh, but worldwide on the use of vaccines. And so, Mark, uh, do you have an answer for John as to, you know, what we can do better next time around? And I would argue uh, that we could have done a lot better this time around, too. Well, clearly, this is a critically important question, not only for today, but for what we do with the next uh, healthcare emergency. I agree with you, Dr. Gold, that this starts at a very early age, that we need to really do a better job with uh, instructing, um, really starting in elementary school and, and getting um, our, our students and uh, adult learners um, more ingrained with uh, scientific literacy, understanding uh, risk, understanding just a little bit about statistics. And with that information, they would be well armed to be able to interpret information a little bit more accurately. Uh, I agree that the degree of scientific uh, misinformation and disinformation and the level of skepticism that has been sown has been truly tragic. And this is, uh, you know, I don't want to pin it all on social media, but there certainly has been a great influence uh, from social media. Uh, we have just a, a increasing amount of skepticism in our population uh, directed towards authority figures, whether that be somebody in the medical field or in any other field. And I think that that's a, a real problem. So I completely agree. We need to learn how to uh, use those tools that are available to us to our advantage. And so this would be uh, all of our popular uh, media as well as uh, social media. Uh, learn to do a better job of getting accurate, transparent information out there. And I think that's one of the problems that we've had uh, throughout the pandemic is um, it's difficult to communicate clearly when there's a large degree of ambiguity. But I think that uh, describing to people what you know, what you don't know, and being very open about that, and then trying to tell them what you're going to do in order to answer that question and when they can expect maybe a little bit more information and a better answer are all very critically important as we uh, went forward with the pandemic. And unfortunately, we had to relearn some of those lessons uh, multiple times during the pandemic of how to best transmit uh, clear, transparent information uh, to the public. As we go forward, we clearly need to identify uh, those folks who are influencers that we may be able to give the information to, uh, again, clear, accurate, truthful information that then they're able to use to influence their audiences. All very critically important questions. And uh, I completely agree with John. If you look at the, the um, uh, rate of booster vaccination in our country compared to just about any other country in the world that you would want to compare yourself to, uh, we lag far behind. And this is just a real national tragedy at this point that uh, we should have uh, more boosters out there be saving more lives. Absolutely. Interesting how we have to restructure social media in order to keep misinformation from spreading like wildfire. But I think that you hit the nail right there on the head, Dr. Rupp. All right. Well, we are going to pause for a quick break. But we have James from California hanging on the line. So hang on, James. We will get to your call right when we come back. Plus, we're going to ask Dr. Rupp if we need to worry about brain eating amoebas in our lakes and rivers as the temperatures warm up. Stick around for the answer to that. More Rural Health Matters coming your way right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We're going to go straight to the phones. We have calls lined up. James from California. Thanks for joining us, James. Go right ahead. Hey. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Jim Sharp, Bakersfield, Chico, California, NorCal. 
A couple of questions about therapeutics. I live in a very rural area with a lot of primary care physicians, mainly NPs, PAs. Why don't they prescribe therapeutics? Uh, For example, Ziflamax, high-dose zinc, hydrochloroquine. That would be my question in regards to the vaccines. I work for Pfizer. I did anyway. I know about the vaccines. So I got two vaccines and the booster. Why can I not get, in a rural area, therapeutics? I can read my question to doc, both of your doctors there. Well, first of all, thank you, James, and uh, thank you for your service if you work for Pfizer. It's obviously a, a great company that's played an incredibly important role in the development of uh, many different uh, therapeutics and uh, vaccines uh, uh, as well. You know, I don't know why uh, the, uh, you know, the, there's been uh, uh, a tendency to uh, uh, limit some of the access to therapeutics. Uh, you know, I think particularly the, uh, the oral uh, antiviral agents such as Paxlovid, uh, you know, we'll ask Dr. Rupp in just a second, but I think the, uh, there's concern about drug-drug interactions that may occur. Uh, and there are some of them that have become uh, quite significant over time. Uh, we're dealing with a disease that has a fairly significant uh, degree of hospitalization and, you know, morbidity and mortality, but, you know, nowhere near as high as other diseases. So it all, uh, you know, ultimately comes down to the judgment uh, of the risk-benefit ratio. You know, but I can tell you, uh, having had relatives and friends who have taken Paxlovid, uh, in, in the setting of acute COVID, it has been a miraculous uh, result in reducing their symptoms, accelerating uh, their course to recovery, and by the way, reducing their chance of long COVID, which has just recently come out in a publication. But I don't know, Dr. Rupp, do you think there's been a reluctance to prescribe some of these uh, scientifically proven therapeutics? Now, ivermectin and others are a different story because the science there is uh, certainly not uh, supportive of, of the prescribing those drugs, but of those that are scientifically proven to be safe and uh, effective, what do you think? Well, one of the things that we've certainly learned during the pandemic is the importance of quickly doing studies that really answer the question of whether a therapeutic agent is useful. And as you've noted, Dr. Gold, uh, a number of those uh, medicines that we thought might have some beneficial effect Uh, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, high-dose zinc, azithromycin, uh, those have all been completely debunked, and those really are not useful. Uh, There has been a reluctance to use some of the antivirals that clearly have been shown to be effective, and you mentioned uh, really the effectiveness of Paxlovid. Uh, The reason I think that that's not getting as much uh, use as it should is some of the drug interactions, but I would very much stress to providers that if they're a little bit careful and they uh, go to the sites that are available, they can oftentimes figure out how to change the dose of a medicine that uh, might have some interactions or just tweak the therapeutic regimen a little bit in in order to enable the use of Paxlovid. Um, If that truly is contraindicated, then using remdesivir is probably your next best bet. Uh, Again, this is a direct antiviral Uh, The downside of remdesivir is it has to be given intravenously, so that obviously makes it much more difficult to give on an outpatient sort of basis. Um, So, you know, we do have uh, some medicines that are clearly beneficial. Uh, We're in a much, much better place than we were three years ago, uh, knowing what medicines uh, do work, having a vaccine that is effective, particularly against serious illness, hospitalization, and death, and then having some of these therapeutics that we know uh, truly can change the game for people. Yeah, and making them available in rural America. I really appreciate that call. Thank you so much. We are going to go back to the phones. Sally from Oklahoma joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Sally. Go right ahead. Hi there. I am just so curious as to why you don't spend more time trying to explain to people how they can boost their immune systems instead of peddling Pfizer's um, vaccines. I, I mean, it makes me think that either your university is being paid by Pfizer or something, because I know a lot of people that are vaccine injured, a lot. And I, I'm, I'm just kind of shocked that you don't ever talk to people about increasing their vitamin D. You're just doing things to get out in the sunshine, do things to boost, 
boost your immune system. I mean, God designed us very uniquely to have a uni- uh, an immune system that's beautiful, that if you're healthy, it works well. And the, these vaccines do not keep people from getting COVID. I know a lot of people that are boosted that have been hospitalized and even have died from COVID. Well, first of all, Sally, thank you for calling. Uh, rest assured, uh, I am not paid by any pharmaceutical company uh, at all, zero, none. Uh, and, uh, and that will remain the case. Uh, if that were to ever change, I would certainly disclose that fully uh, to our audience. Your points are well taken that having a healthy immune system uh, is an important component of preventing infection and minimizing the severity of infection uh, as well. And there are things that people can do through diet and exercise uh, to maintain as strong an immune system as possible. And then there are all sorts of dietary supplements uh, that have been uh, recommended, that have been tried. Some have been proven to be at least of some effect. Others are more urban legend to be effective uh, in terms of minerals and vitamins and other things to uh, boost the strength uh, of our immune responses. We certainly know a lot more about how to reduce the intensity of our immune system for people that have, as was our earlier caller said, a wacky uh, immune system than we do about how to strengthen it. But Dr. Rupp, do you have any thoughts on how we can strengthen our immune systems? Well, thank you, Dr. Gold. I'll agree with Sally that uh, the human immune system is quite remarkable and very versatile and uh, works very well. Um, what I tell people is sort of do what your grandmother told you. And so that means, uh, you know, getting a healthy diet, a moderate amount of exercise, try to get good sleep. Uh, these are the things that you can do to really help your immune system work at its peak level. Um, I also am a proponent for vitamin D, particularly in the northern climates during the winter when we're just not outside enough getting enough sunlight. So uh, I'll, I'll certainly sign on to uh, recommending that as a general measure that people can do, again, to keep their immune systems working at the peak efficiency. And those are the best things that one can do in order to uh, uh, fight off viruses as best as your body is able to. But unfortunately, as we saw so very clearly, particularly in the early days of the pandemic, when you have a virus that comes in where your immune system is not uh, primed to respond to it, it can wreak absolute havoc. And uh, the vaccines have been effective in saving uh, many, many lives. They're not perfect by any means. They do have some side effects and toxicity associated with them. But the downside of getting COVID and rolling the dice and potentially having all of the morbidity and some degree of mortality that's associated with the disease, as opposed to the much less likelihood of having uh, bad outcomes from the vaccine, clearly favor the vaccine. Absolutely. Well, we didn't get to the brain eating amoebas, the potential as spring and summertime are approaching. So Dr. Gold, I'm gonna have to forward that question to next week's show. We're going to have to pass the buck on that one for next week. So I'm passing that to you. No, no problem. Uh, I will definitely address the brain eating amoebas. Hey, I want to know. I want to know. I'm sure the people out there in rural America want to know as well. Streams, creeks, they're looking good this time of year. Dr. Rupp, thank you so much for joining us. You always bring vast knowledge. Your expertise is unparalleled. We thank you so much. We know how busy you are as well. This is the tail end of your day. So thank you. And Dr. Gold, as always, we look forward to seeing you next Monday. We appreciate you being with us every single week. And we look forward to what we'll be talking about next week in addition to the potential of brain-eating amoebas. That's worth tuning back in for. We'll see you all next week.